Bonsoir à tous. Bienvenue dans cette nouvelle émission de 30 minutes d'actualité scientifique organisée par le comité scientifique de la SFAR. Nous sommes heureux de, de vous accueillir toujours plus nombreux pour ces émissions. Sachez que vous avez possibilité d'émettre vos questions directement via le site de la SFAR, via les réseaux sociaux et également via Twitter et Facebook. Je serai entouré aujourd'hui de notre invité, le professeur Rupert Pierce, ainsi que du docteur Tobias Goss, qui nous, qui nous présentera euh, Rupert un petit peu plus en, en, en détail. Euh, nous sommes ensemble pour euh, 30 minutes d'actualité scientifique et euh, nous nous attendons à répondre à vos nombreuses questions. So, um, I suggest that we switch to English. So we are very, very honored, very pleased to have you, Rupert. Um, Rupert Piers, Professor Piers, is a very eminent international expert on perioperative optimization for elective and emergency surgery. And he works at the Queen Mary University of London and is a consultant at the Royal London Hospital in London. So um, today our topic is optimization for emergency surgery for the very sick patient. And um, I would like to, to launch the dance and with a question whether actually perioperative mortality in emergency surgery, Rupert, do you think this is really an issue that we should care about? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation to Paris. It's always a nice place to visit. Uh, um, Paris uh, and London are still connected by a railway, which I will use very regularly. Uh, um, So yeah, definitely, the emergency surgery patient is, is a big problem. Um, uh, and, and they're a big problem because of, of, of two main reasons. It's number one, they're unpredictable. Uh, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you don't know when it's going to happen. And our ability to plan for these cases is, is, is very disrupted. It's very disorganized. Um, uh, uh, but it's not so sick usually that this patient needs the full intensive care support. So there are some surgical patients that need everything that an intensive care unit can do, and they get a full package of doctors, of nurses, of organ support. But most emergency surgery patients fall short of that standard. Um, and so they're left to be looked after by surgeons who are no longer experts in critically ill patients. They're experts in surgery, they're really good at it, but they're not experts in critical illness. And so these patients don't get the type of care that they need. And because we don't see them every day, because they're a little bit different, we think, well, maybe there aren't so many of them, maybe they're not so important, or if they do die, we say, well, they were sick, so yes, of course, sick people die. But when you start to count these patients, when you start to see how many there actually are, we find out that there's far, far more patients than we expected and that the number who die is far higher than we really thought it was. So, yeah, there's a hidden problem in plain sight. So if you say it's hidden, that means that we have some data, but mm -hmm. maybe not data that's comparable to mortality, mobility in elective surgery. Yeah, so... We, we try to frame emergency surgery as being the same kind of challenge as elective surgery, but it's really completely different. You've got a patient with an acute medical problem, uh, and you're going to uh, take that patient and, and deliver major tissue injury by the nature of surgery as well. So it makes it even more challenging than, it, than it, a problem than it was to begin with. Coupled with the fact that a lot of the patients who need emergency surgery are older, Uh, a lot of them have lots of comorbid diseases, but have diabetes, maybe they have heart disease, maybe they have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lots of other reasons why they're going to get sick. These patients really struggle to make a good recovery after surgery. Now, for most anaesthetists in the UK, the challenge is to keep the patient alive during surgery. This was always the challenge of the anaesthetist. This was why the profession existed. I don't know about France, but in the UK, a death during surgery is a very rare thing, very rare, and only maybe a very severe trauma or, or a bleeding aortic aneurysm will, will die on the operating table. Um, most of these patients die days or weeks 
often months after surgery. Um, uh, and that's long after the anaesthetist is no longer involved in their care. That you can trace back all the problems to that very moment when they were having surgery and the standards of care that they were having and the types of things people were doing. Because on the one hand, we can focus on keeping the patient alive. But on the other hand, there are also things we do that affect tomorrow, next week, next month, when the patient's still recovering from that emergency procedure. And Rupert, do you think this kind of patients deserve a um, dedicated team or a dedicated organization to, to cope for, um, let's say, the availability of the OR, availability mm -hmm. of surgical beds, availability of step-down units? Do you think that a dedicated team towards an emergency patient, emergency mm -hmm. surgical patients, would make the difference? Uh, I think it's part of the solution. Um, so in the UK, traditionally, emergency surgery was done by the junior doctors. Uh, um, uh, and now you are seeing a new breed of, of, of consultants, of senior doctors, who specialise in emergency surgery. Uh, and so in the UK, they're called the emergency general surgeon. Uh, and, and there are consultants in emergency general surgery who will do your emergency laparotomy, your bowel obstruction, your perforation. And that's their main job. That's their main skill. And they work with anaesthetists who, who are specialising in emergency surgery as well. Um, and so they have better connections within intensive care. They are thinking more about the long-term outcomes of the patient. They're thinking more about treating sepsis and seeing surgery as a treatment for sepsis rather than a, a, just a cure for a disease. Uh, um, and thinking very differently about the patient in a, in a general sense. And I think that cultural change is really interesting and really important, that it's no longer a second-class patient. You know, there is prestige in delivering really, really good life-saving care for emergency surgical patients. And, and that culture shift has happened slowly over about 10 years, but it's now very present in the UK. And, and I think we're seeing the whole attitude towards these patients change as a result. So that's very interesting. So how, how do, you, do you think there's anything that the medical community in the UK did to facilitate this change? Or did it happen spontaneously? And in emergency surgery, you have lots of people carrying on about one patient, like trauma. So you, how do you think can you bring these people together to make the process that you mentioned easier and to get everybody on the same page about, around this patient? Um, I think a lot of different things happened uh, uh, that had a unified effect that, that we've been very lucky with. I think that there were problems with uh, the amount of work that senior doctors had to do uh, and uh, that it was no longer possible just to add the emergency case on to a routine operating list because it's already full. Um, the, 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 the volume of surgical procedures we're doing is going up and up and up and up every year. And that seems to be a global phenomenon. Certainly in the UK, we're offering more surgery than we ever did before. And I would imagine the same is true in France. So um, the, 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 the surgeons are, are more and more busy. Um, uh, and it's very difficult within their rotors and the way their patterns are working to find time to do these emergency cases. So there was a forced solution uh, uh, to deal with that problem for surgeons. I think that's one thing. I think also there were groups of anaesthetists around the country who were waking up to the severity of the problem, in particular for uh, fracture neck ophema and for emergency laparotomy, emergency abdominal surgery patients, and realising that these particular groups had lots of complex problems, they're older, lots of comorbid diseases, very serious acute illness, need to interact with uh, uh, elderly care physicians need to interact with surgeons, need to work much more as a team. And that, those groups started doing, uh, uh, studying the epidemiology to work out how many of these patients there were, you know, how bad their outcomes were. And those little studies turned into big national studies. And we now have two prospective audits all the time for emergency laparotomy and fracture neck ophema patients. So any hospital knows how they're doing 
in terms of outcomes. And those audits led to government targets to improve care, and, and, and it just snowballs over and over. We still have a lot of work to do, don't get me wrong, but, but uh, I think that, that those are the, the seeds of that uh, trend in interest in emergency surgery. We have a question from the, the audience. You, you said just before that uh, some of the emergency surgery was done on top of the elective case. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think that um, shift for doctors should be shorter than 12 hours so that every doctor um, going to care for a, an emergency surgical patient uh, should be fresher uh, than if he had already walked for uh, 12 or 14 hours. Do you think that we should, um, we should uh, in, involve in a shorter uh, shifts for uh, young doctors, for instance? Uh, this is a very difficult question. It's a very political question uh, in the UK, certainly. Um, uh, when I was a trainee doctor, we used to work a 24-hour shift. Um, but it was considered normal that you would sleep for some of those 24 hours. Now, sometimes you had to be awake all night, but sometimes you had a quiet night and you got to go to bed. But, but you had a bed, you had a bed in the hospital, and it was considered normal to use the bed to go to sleep. Uh, um, now, our, our junior doctors, uh, um, they do 12-hour shifts, and they are expected to be up the entire time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and doing 12 hours on a night, on a Monday night, a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night. I, I think this is not necessarily a better pattern for sleep and concentration and, and to be at the, uh, 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 to affect your motor skills and all of these, your confusion. Uh, so I'm not sure 12 hour shifts are necessarily the, the universal solution to, to tiredness and, uh, and the problems related to tiredness. I don't know that I'm not an expert. Okay. If you don't have any other questions from the audience, I would like to dig into something that you said about um, the change that took place over the last 10 years in the UK mm -hmm. with regard to these patients. Um, so my first question, it will be two questions actually. Uh, the first question is, um, are there any specific patients that need to benefit from these kind of programs? Are there any target pathologies or target mm -hmm. patients? And the second is the elements that you mentioned sound very much like a quality improvement program. Mm -hmm. So um, I, would, I think it would be very interesting for the audience to find out what a quality improvement program actually is like in the UK and what the individual clinician can do to make a quality program happen in his hospital or mm -hmm. his institution. So, so two questions. The first was, which patients should you concentrate on? Um, well, I mean, my question would be, how many deaths is too many? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, is, is it okay if we have one in 100 deaths? Is it okay if we have one in 20 deaths? Are we aiming for one in 1,000 deaths? I mean, how many people do we think it's okay to die? Uh, I'm, I'm not being funny. But, but that's the logic of the question. The logic of the question says, we can't save every life, so we're not going to try. Okay? My logic says, unless you try, how do you know? And I think this is really important. Uh, uh, it really challenges our, our attitude towards what can be achieved in, uh, in terms of improving patient outcomes. Um, a lot of uh, anaesthetists and surgeons, we have to think about the personality types, who, who we are. We are attracted to surgery, either anaesthesia, of the immediacy of the nature of what we do. Uh, we're often uh, uh, technically based in our mind, our personality. And we often think in a binary kind of way, right and wrong. Your patient is either intubated or they are not intubated. There is nothing in the middle there. Your patient either has an anastomosis done correctly or incorrectly. There's no kind of debate about what's good. Uh, and anaesthetists and surgeons are brought up uh, uh, from the, the, the youngest age with these attitudes. And then we think that everything is binary. 
that everything is that simple, that everything is either this way or that way, and that way is wrong, so it's got to be this way. Mm. But actually, that, there are lots of things that we do that are grey, that, that are a grey scale in, in terms of what's good enough. Um, and so the example I often give is, uh, imagine the last day you had at work. Was it a good day or was it a bad day? Um, let's say it was a good day. Let's say everything worked. The patient turned up on time. They'd, they'd stopped all the medicines they were supposed to stop. They took all the medicines they were supposed to take. They got into the operating room on time. The surgeon was there. All the right equipment were ready. He did a surgical checklist. Uh, it confirmed everything was good to go. And it was a very straightforward procedure. Yeah. And then think about a different day, when the patient turns up late, they take the wrong medicines, they had diabetes but nobody realised, now their blood sugar's out of control, they haven't quite fasted for six hours or whatever your rule is in your hospital, uh, you know, their blood pressure's a bit low at induction, should we stop, should we carry on, and you know, you can keep following that through. Some days we're at the best of ourselves and sometimes we're less at the best of ourselves. Um, and anaesthetists and surgeons, when you talk about quality improvement, they think you mean that their best is not good enough, that their best must be better. No, no, this isn't, this is about their worst performance. It's about making their worst performance as good as their best performance. Because your best is good enough every single day, the best that you can do, I've worked with you, I can tell you now, it's very, very good. Uh, but, but sometimes you're not at your best. And the way to make you a much more successful doctor is to be at your best more often. Um, and the way to make a hospital better is to make it at its best more often. And so quality improvement, it, it says, we can be at our best more often and we can find places where things can be better and we can make them better. Uh, and, and to say that quality improvement for your surgery is necessary, but for somehow for your surgery it's less important, but for each individual patient, they, they matter. Each individual patient is somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's sister, their brother. Uh, and each individual person matters. So until we focus on everybody, until doctors are no longer needed, then there's work to do. That, that would be my focus. I don't worry about my retirement just yet, but uh, I think that's the approach we should take. But that is... It's a, it's a nice, it's a very noble challenge, but it's a, a great challenge. So how can I do this in my hospital? I work in a small hospital. Mm -hmm. Imagine I work in a small hospital. I don't have many resources. Um, and I realize that we have a challenge with, let's say, emergency laparotomies. And I feel that I don't manage to get a dialogue with the surgeons. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have much time, maybe. How can I at least not sort of this, this very noble, how can I uh, become, I don't feel like becoming a perioperative Jedi, but how can I at least sort of feel not completely powerless and, and make small steps that will really make a change for my patient? Yeah, I, I mean, again, it harks back to your, your best is good enough. You know, the best that you can do is, is always good enough. Um, uh, and that's true for almost everybody that you're ever going to meet. It's very rare to meet a doctor whose best isn't really, really good. Um, in our experience, in the UK, we've been working very hard on this for a few years now. And, um, and, and next month, we're about to launch a centre for perioptive care at the Royal College of Anaesthetists, which is going to really uh, be an exemplar, we hope internationally, Uh, uh, for the idea of perioperative medicine as a way in which anaesthetists can lead that team of multi-professional team to improve patient outcome. Um, but there's a few little tricks of the trade. The first thing is, if your surgeon is being difficult uh, and won't support what you do, go and help the other surgeon. Because when one surgeon knows that another surgeon is getting a better package of care for their patients than, than he or she is, they'll want it. Uh, and, and you see this with enhanced recovery pathways. Once the, the orthopedic surgeons realized that the colorectal surgeons were getting extra care and extra resources, they wanted it for their patients. And then the gynecologists wanted it for their patients, and so, so it goes on. Doctors are competitive, and surgeons are our most competitive doctors. Uh, and, and so you just have to make them want it. 
And once a surgeon realises that you're prepared to work hard to get their patients' outcomes to be much better, my guess is you'll find they're tremendously supportive. Whether they are an easy personality or whether they're a difficult personality, most surgeons will be very, very grateful uh, uh, for anaesthetists who would go that extra mile to improve their patient outcomes. Let's not forget, it's the surgeon who sees them after the operation. It's not the anaesthetist. It's the surgeon who has to look them in the eye and say, I'm sorry, there's been a complication. Uh, you know, the operation didn't go well. It's a surgeon who has to tell their family when the patient has died. Or it's a surgeon who has to keep seeing them in clinic after they've gone home, month after month with those protracted problems or that wound infection or that fistula. You know, it's the surgeon. It's not the anaesthetist. So we perhaps need to be a little bit sympathetic to the challenge that our surgeon has. And maybe if they're a little bit difficult, maybe there's a reason. <laughs> We've got um, a burning question from the, from the audience. Uh, do you think it is time for an um, emergency laparotomy audit in Europe? Do you think time has come for this? Uh, well, uh, I, I hesitate as a British person to tell Europe what to do. Uh, but uh, I think that it's proved very effective in the UK. The, um, the, the national emergency laparotomy audit in the UK has now been going for uh, over five years. Uh, we've uh, just finished a, a, a big uh, a nationwide quality improvement project, which is about to be published in The Lancet next month, looking at ways in which we tried to improve patient care. Actually, we struggled to improve patient care uh, in a package of of things that we would all want for our grandmothers, uh, we really struggled to make changes to those things. Despite all the attention that we're giving to emergency surgery, we're still struggling to improve their care. Um, and it turns out that this is a very, very long task. It, it doesn't happen quickly. So uh, by continually auditing our patient care and by continually auditing our outcomes, We've been able to see gradual improvements over time, but they've been very, very slow. And without that continual measurement, I think we would lose focus, we would stop concentrating on the patients, and we'd start looking at other problems. And it keeps the mind of the politicians on these patients as well. And it's resulted in uh, financial incentives for hospitals, which means that you can go to your hospital manager and say, I can make more money for you if you allow us to do these extra things for these patients. And all of this is very, very helpful. So it just shines a spotlight on that patient group. And, and when you do that, it's an opportunity for us as a specialty to show what else that we have to offer. And that means that we can suddenly become part of the good team. You know, we can be the good guys helping solve problems uh, for our surgical colleagues, helping solve problems for our, uh, our medical managers helping improve patient outcomes, meaning the patient uh, uh, gets better quicker, they go home quicker, their care costs less. This is good for society, it's good for the patient, and it gives, as a specialty, it gives us much more influence uh, to make things happen that we think are important. So to me, it's a, an all-round win for anaesthesia and critical care. As far as emergency surgery is concerned, do you, do you use a triage algorithm or some kind of classification uh, like uh, tax or... Uh... So it's that question again about how many people it's okay to die. Uh, no, uh, uh, um, no, so, uh, uh, so the triage, um, we have to accept that, that we can't admit everybody to critical care. Uh, this was mainly um, about the surgical theater. Uh -huh. uh, which patient, I, imagine I have two or three operating rooms and yeah. I have five surgical emergencies. Uh, how do I um, prioritize this patient over the other one? I think you really need to ask yourself, are you trying to solve today's problem or tomorrow's? Um, so if you solve today's problem and it goes away, the problem will come back tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. Uh, and I think that we need to really think about uh, the impact of that philosophy that we can prioritise and it, it's okay for somebody to lose out. Uh, because we may not think it's okay, 
It, uh, we may triage three patients and have one who's sick, it's one in the middle and one worse, but they're all really, really sick. One doesn't get into intensive care. One has their surgery delayed, whatever it might be. One has a more junior surgeon. All these different things can happen. Um, until we have the attitude that that's not okay, that they all, three of those patients, deserve the best care that we can give, then you're, you're going to be stuck in that idea that it's okay to be less than your best some of the time. You mean to accept low, lower standards yeah. just to be able to cope with the workload? Yeah. So I, I say that's not okay. So you're but now I've got a problem to deliver better care, but my problem is now everybody else's problem. You know? Whereas before it was just my problem. It was just my thing to worry about. And now it's everybody's thing to worry about. And I think that change in attitude is really important because uh, although care for surgical patients has improved over the last 20 years, we're offering surgery to more and more people all the time. They are getting older. We have a paper coming out um, in a few weeks uh, that shows in the UK that the, uh, the surgical population is getting older. It's no surprise, right? Because the population in general is getting older. And indications... Operation But the surgical population is aging faster than, than the, the population. background population, mm. which means that we're disproportionately offering surgery to old people who have frailty problems, who have chronic comorbid disease problems. So this issue of triage is not going to go away. It's going to get worse. And unless you change your philosophy and attitude towards those patients, you may as well not offer them surgery. Because if you can't offer them surgery with a chance of success... Why are you doing it? Patients don't have surgery to be alive 30 days later. You know, this whole idea of 30-day mortality as a patient outcome, that's not a patient outcome. Name me one patient who thinks it's a good result. I lived for 30 days. You so, know, they're looking for a little bit more than that. So withdrawal of care in an emergency situation is for you something that should be considered giving the context of the patient? I, I think whether to treat or not to treat is always a question. Uh, and uh, that's a, a question, the answer has a different answer for every single patient. It, it depends on their, their chronic health, it depends on their quality of life, and most of all it depends on what they want. Uh, um, but yeah, there are some patients who we probably shouldn't treat, um, and if we're offering surgery to more and more elderly people, it's likely that there will be more people that we shouldn't treat. The society is getting used to being to living with chronic disease. That, that's a thing that didn't happen 30 years ago. Uh, but, but now society is used to living with chronic disease. They think they're indestructible uh, until they get hit by a, a bus, until they have emergency surgery, until they get septic shock. And then the family are surprised. I know they're 85, but they were, but they so, were so healthy. <laughs> uh, and and we all, we've all been there. But it's no surprise to us, but it is a surprise to the families. Since we come to the end, maybe... Yeah. Maybe if you could um, deliver a, a take-home message for uh, emergency surgery and uh, perioperative care of the emergency surgical patient, what would you tell us in what a few you, words? For example, the things that were part of the bundle in the study that you, that you mentioned that would come out in the Lancet. What, what, if you had to create a bundle, what are the things that you would like people to do? I, I mean, I think that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, um, I, what I would probably say is, is that you need to... The, the things that your patient needs, are, the things that are most effective are usually fairly obvious. Um, and it's your ability as a doctor to negotiate those for your patient and make sure that they get them, but not just today's patient, tomorrow and the next day as well. Um, so that, that's one important thing, and the best way to do that is to create a framework that allows you to deliver that. And perioptive medicine is, is one framework. There are other ways of thinking about it, like ERAS for emergency surgery. And I think promoting those frameworks that means the system supports you to deliver good care is the way not just to save today's patient, but tomorrow's and the next day's as well. So there's no magic bullet. It's the framework. It's the process and get everybody to work on this framework. Uh, uh, so those exciting, innovative, brand new, uh, hot-off-the-press treatments, they don't have so much impact. 
good quality patient care, being at our best more of the time, that, that's the thing that has a slow attrition on, on poor outcomes and gradually improves patient care. Okay. Julia? I think we, we come to the end of the time. We, we're very, very pleased. It was great to have you. Thank you so much for all your insight and perspective. Uh, and we say hello, goodbye, not hello. We say <laughs> goodbye for the next session, which is on the 7th of May. It's Vincent de Gauss talking about uh, post-surgery stroke. So it's again on the 7th of May, uh, 5 p.m. in the afternoon. We hope to see you again and connect for the next time. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Goodbye. See you there.